Welcome to the Best Music Podcast. My name is Dan the Music Man, and this week's featured guest is Dave Fuse Fujinski. Dave Fuse Fujinski is an iconoclastic, look it up, innovator and a rebel with a guitar, fluent in rock fusion, wicked fretless blues slides, eastern melodicism, western microtonalism, and everything in between. His remarkably open-minded and versatile approach to his instrument and music in general has made him a first call player to lead and tour with recording projects uh, with remarkably diverse cast of characters, including Stuart Copeland of The Police, Dak, Jack DeJanet of Miles Davis and John Coltrane, and also in and of his own name, John Zone, Hiromi, Jojo Mayer, Dennis Chambers, Rudresh Mahanthapa, Marcus Miller, Billy Hart, John Medeski, Ronald Shannon Jackson's Decoding Society and countless others. He has played on nearly 100, probably more now, recordings as a session musician, band leader, or band member, won a Guggenheim Fellowship in 2011, and is a professor at the prestigious Berklee College of Music in Boston. Best known as a leader of Screaming Headless Torsos, Kiff, and as a member of Hasidic New Wave, Fuse launched Planet Microjam, an institute that explores the use of microtones, more on that later, in groove jazz, ethnic folk, and other contexts in 2012. With this impressive resume under his belt, the mad scientist guitar hero is now seeking to bring his music to new audiences. You can find him, davidfujinski.com. That's David, F-I-U-C-Z-Y-N-S-K-I.com. Facebook, at Fuse, F-U-Z-E official, torsos.com, and on Facebook, at Screaming Headless Torsos. Dave, thanks so much for taking the time out to come on the podcast. Wow. That was a lot. Are we done now? (laughs) (laughs) Well, Dave, let's talk a little bit about the aforementioned microtones, because many people out there may not have even heard of microtones or understand what they are. So do you think you could give us maybe a Cliff Notes version, if it's not putting you on the spot, of what microtones are and how we, from our Western music perspective, Western in quotations, can perceive them and understand them and quantify them? Um, well, first of all, um, In Western music, we have 12 notes per octave. So if you look at a piano and you play 12 notes in a row, then you're up an octave and the notes, uh, the sequence repeats. Other systems like Arabic music, they roughly grid their music off of 24 notes per octave. Um, They don't use all the notes, just like we don't use 12 notes all the time in every phrase and every tune. It's just they have accidentals just like us, sharps and flats. Um, There's the uh, Turkish 53-note per octave system. There's a Greek 72-note per octave system. That's actually the one I studied at New England Conservatory with uh, the great Joe Maneri, who was a uh, microtonal pioneer. And the idea is that um, there's some really exciting things you can do outside of 12 notes per octave. We've actually all heard microtones, uh, probably in, in, uh, in blues. Blues is amazing in that you can play, uh, let's say, straight up seventh chords, but you can play, uh, I'm going to be very careful here, kind of like wrong notes, mm. sharp nines, sharp fours, the way those are bent. Those are microtonal. You can't find those notes on the piano. But the way they're played, you know, when it, you know, you put those in the hands of a Jimi Hendrix, and it's just, it, it, you know, those searing notes that just grabs, grabs you by the heart. And it's just, it's amazing. And when I heard, um, let's say, an Arabic call to prayer or some kind of Eastern melody, it kind of grabs me. In the same way, so my microtonal approach was initially kind of an Eastern microtonal approach. Those same microtonal notes would affect me in the same way, so I kind of would perceive them as Eastern blue notes, and that's how I got into it. So, but when I tried to play and and figure these notes out, and I would apply our Western 
12 note per octave rulers like I could, you can't find those notes on the guitar so that's why I went fretless so I can play various um, uh, microtones so um, to, to jump in and clarify two things uh, for for the um, sort of average well-educated musical listener we're talking about microtones are going to be in between the space of the half step. So between A and A sharp or B flat, there are, let's say, just for argument's sake, we could divide that space into 100 divisions. Yes. And then we could play any one of those. Yes. Yeah, so what microtonalists do is they... Um... Maybe I could plug the guitar in. Oh, please. Dave, maybe you could um, sort of back up a step and demonstrate what we mean by half step and then demonstrate the various uh, microtones within that space that we can achieve. Half steps. So this is an octave. We all know that, major scale. So that would be 12 half steps. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Um, let me see the melody. So, yeah, so this is a half step. So, uh... <laughs> Batman. Are we going to have a problem with uh, copyright? Well, no, for teaching aspects, we don't have to worry about copyright. So Correct. This is Batman with quarters, with, with uh, half steps. This would be Batman with quarter tones. This would be Batman with six tones. So quarter tones would be two notes per half step. So that would be 24 notes per octave. This would be six tones. Getting kind of silly. This is that getting great. 36 notes per octave. Uh, let's try eighth tones. Okay. So then it kind of turns into, you know, Marcus Miller would make fun of me. He was like, oh, he still <laughs> fuses a crack addict. He plays <laughs> those notes in the cracks. So it's like, he's like, oh, is that the mosquito music? Like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> Anyway, thanks, Marcus. Um, but we've heard microtones when, when, um, when we hear blues, let me see if I can. So this is what I tell people. You've heard this before and you actually like this. Right. And people are like, what? This sounds terrible. Let me play it again. You've heard this before, and you like this. Okay. The thing is, these are blue notes that I've I've taken. I've stripped away all the slides and the slurred. So when I go, see what I'm saying? <laughs> so, uh, in the West, we we know blue notes. Uh, we know microtones with the blues. Usually, they're around the, sh the sharp nine. So one player will be closer to the second. Or the, the, the third. But if I take the slides and the slurs out, it's... So that's... You can't find those notes on the piano. Or Again, if I take the slurs out... Sounds completely out of tune. So, you know, it's obviously, you know, in the hands of a Jimi Hendrix, this is going to sound amazing. But right there, I played a bunch of notes that are microtonal. Um, and Dave, the reason why you're able to play these microtonal notes is because you're on a fretless guitar. I should say that. These, these are merely lines, so I can see. So... 
There are no frets on this, just like a violin, totally smooth. So for our audience members who are just audio only right now, they're listening on Apple Podcasts, just to describe what's going on, you have a double-necked guitar, just like we've seen uh, Jimmy Page play, um, except the difference here is that the bottom neck has frets, which are those metal bands that are going to help you define the half steps. And then the top neck is completely smooth, so there's no frets, but there's little lines to give you guides, and you also have fret markers. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can completely modulate pitch freely on the top neck, whereas on the bottom neck you are sort of in conventional guitar land. Exactly. So <clears throat> another way in the West that we've heard um, microtones, and I kind of joke about this, <laughs> microtonal ear training can save your life. So that's a major tr triad, major third. That's a minor, uh, minor third. Right in between... So, if your car stalls on the train tracks and you hear this neutral third speeding at you, it's time to ditch that car because that train is, is coming right at you. So, neutral third, bad, get out of there. <laughs> It, it's also kind of like the 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 sound that's used like in in movies when there's an accident and you know the the ca that car horn still still going it's like so there are different ways also like video game music a lot of that stuff is not really tempered and to be clear what you just played is a neutral third it's between the major and the minor third exactly so it's not it's so let's try something here let's see i like this microtonal stuff because you can come up with completely new harmonies at first this should sound out of tune to you but this is a uh neutral 11 chord it's not a natural 11 or sharp 11 it's in between so it has this almost like alien sound it's not this we don't hear there's no beating because this this 11 it's it's actually the 11th overtone it's a natural, it's a natural in, uh, interval that we don't hear in, in our music. And I just think there's a really, really exciting things you can do. Let's unpack the statement you just made because it's kind of incredible. So normally when we hear notes that are out of tune with each other, we hear beats. And that's because the actual waves of the sounds are not quite lining up and so we're hearing those mountains and valleys where the waves don't quite line up yeah. so can you try one more time breaking this down as to why we're not hearing the beats here well here is when you tune you can hear that's not in tune yes although i'm really weird i like this <laughs> um Eleventh overtone, so this would be like um, it's it's a natural interval, but it's neither a natural four. Here, here comes the bride. That's a fourth tritone. Heard that in a million metal, what have you tunes, but it's right in between. So it has a very consonant but alien sound. So these are the kind of things that you can um, that you can use. So as requested, here is Mystic Micro Jam. Here we go from the top.
Oh, I'm loving it. It's, by the way, this is not my disgusted face. This is, oh, I'm digging this so hard face. <laughs> but you know, it's okay because I have to commend, uh, congratulate you. The first time I heard microtonal music, I, I hated it. I absolutely hated it. I actually went up to one of the musicians later and I tried to talk them out of it. I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> But then, as Duke Ellington said, music only comes in two forms, good and bad. And I then I heard a smoking, I forget the name, Allspice, smoking flute clarinet duo written in 72 notes per octave. I was like, wow. And so there is that neutral 11 chord. <laughs> Yeah, I think they're exciting things to do. Uh, just to give you an idea, this is like blues without blue notes. I mean, it's kind of stiff. But again, if I take out the inflections, <laughs> it's gone. So here, here is a comparison of um, a scale that we call, I mean, you know, heard this in a million metal tunes, also something like, so... Now, if I add microtones, it has a lot more spice. So the flat nine, I'm going to sharp it. The third, I'm going to flat it. And the flat six, I'm going to goose up a little bit. So this is a Turkish version of this makam called Hijaz. So this is our Western version. This is the Turkish version. Now with inflections. If I took those microtones out, it would sound like this. Kind of boring with microtones. So to be clear, when you're saying inflections, are these like the rules of the road? No, the inflections, I would just say the, you know, the trills, the bends. Ah, yes. Okay. okay. Because if anyone's studied Indian classical music, there are going to be certain rules for how you use different scales at certain times. You're, you're not really talking about that. You're more talking about a general approach to the sound. So with Indian music and Turkish music or uh, Arab it, Middle Eastern music in general. In Indian music, they have something called a raga. In uh, Middle Eastern music, they have something called a makam. In a very crude way, these are scales with rules. Um, you have to omit certain notes on the way up. You have to include them on the way down. It depends on which raga or makam. Some of them have certain shapes. You just can't play up and down. You have to follow a path. It's a very beautiful thing. I'm more of a microtonal chord scale guy. I'm fascinated with a mode, and then I look in a, in a Western way. How can I stack it into harmony? That's, that's what they don't do. And that's like one of the primary things we do at the Planet Microjam Institute. We experiment with microtonal harmony that doesn't exist. So you're approaching it from a sort of jazz mode scale chord harmonized to the fifth, harmonized to the seventh, harmonized to the ninth type of perspective. Yes. But using microtones, which is just absolutely fascinating. Yes. So, um, yes, instead of um, instead of 12 notes per octave, which would be a Western approach, we use microtones. And 
instead of a so-called world music um, approach, we use harmony. Most world musics don't have harmony. It's incidental. That's kind of like the big difference between Western music and so-called non-Western music is harmony. And I want to be very careful. I'm not implying one is better or the other. I'm just fascinated in putting them together, in, I guess, fusing them together. It's... <laughs> uh, I guess I was meant to do that. I mean, it's also just in terms culturally. My mom was black. My dad was German. I was just always... When I... From the get-go, when I went through their records, they had a lot of modern classical and modern classical stuff and jazz and R&B, and I was always, always curious, hmm, if I took a groove from here and a harmony from, you know, this classical thing, a groove from this, I don't know, whatever's on the radio, and then the melodic approach over here, what would happen if I kind of just like, I was always kind of like that, I don't know. I guess it's the musical version with of the kid with the chemistry set who likes to blow things up. <laughs> well, speaking of bringing unique elements together to create a unique sound, um, I really want to play this riff for everyone uh, and then talk a little bit about how you sort of reinvented funk guitar. So, no funk player has sounded like that. We've heard versions of this. We've heard uh, bases of this, but we've not heard this before. So, how did you go about essentially reinventing what funk guitar means? And do you have a name for this style of playing? Oh, my goodness. I've never thought about... That is, it's reinventing i mean the only thing is that uh let's see um i'll have to just angle this down for a second um it's just like i just like to <laughs> if it's like who uses a whammy bar like that in funk it's wild <laughs> I just, I just like it. I mean, I think this is also the original reason I got into microtones because I just like slurring stuff. <laughs> um, and, uh, I mean, I don't know what it is. I just love grooves, and you know, in terms of my. I guess African American background is just, you know, the, the the stuff that comes out of the, especially out of the the black church. It's just, it just gives you that inexplicable feeling of hope. You know, it's mm -hmm. just without even thinking, there's a smile on your face. You know, and um, it's that thing that music in general can do. I mean. There's been so much research of like, you know, if you expose kids to music before the age 14, as a group, these kids do better in sciences, blah, blah, blah. I mean, there's scientific research and there's just, there's also experiential. I mean, these are things I've, these are actual quotes. Hey, how you doing? Good to hear from you. I'm going through a hard time, but music is my sanctuary. I was like, Wow. Or I hosted Michelle and Deggio Cello at this singer and rapper at Berkeley, and this and the guy who was putting it together was like, "Wow, I, I mean, when you when you guys played that tune, I forget what it was. He was like, "Man, that's the tune that got me through my divorce." I was like, "Wow." Or just the same, you know? Or I mean, I mean, the the just the very very straight up like, "Hey, that's my jam." <laughs> You know, the, so that was that's what I was, was trying to convey in that moment. I wasn't even really thinking specifically funk, but this happened to be a funk thing. And I listened to a lot of uh, defunct, um, Kelvin Bell, 
Um, uh, Defunct is Joe Bowie's uh, trombone player, his band. It's kind of like a dirty funk. Um, James Brown, what can you say? Um, later on, I was really lucky to play with Bernie Worrell, um, the keyboard player from Parliament Funkadelic. So all these signature keyboard sounds and grooves you hear on Flash, what was it, Flashlight, uh, uh, um, Atomic Dog and all that stuff, that's him. And um, I mean, if I can share a, an experience, I, I'm not saying it was an out-of-body experience, but I remember there was this great club called Wetlands in um, the city. And we played there, and Bernie took a middle of the set he broke it down you know he cued the band so it was just him and he did this clavinet thing and it was so funky i mean i remember talking to the drummer later we were both like wow we forgot we were at a gig <laughs> he turned us into spectators and and it's like i really felt like i had the privilege to watch him tune into an energy that was really old and profound that that's been here for a long long time and will be here for a long time after all of us are gone and and that's you know in general with grooves and you know you hear vinnie it's kind of like yeah it's this kind of funny happy cool but there's there's hopefully a profound intention or people experience that you know when i see your reaction you were like yeah getting into it i mean <laughs> a it makes me feel really good but there there just seems like something really earthy and beautiful about that and that's that's like something that you know especially these days with all the nasty politics going on it just seems like we really need that what happened you know one thing that's really incredible about your music and i think makes the microtonal releases accessible to anyone is the you talk about it as a universal energy uh, i was thinking about it in a more uh, personalized context like the energy that dave brings to a track so like that fuse feeling of there's this serious driving creative energy behind everything that it's like a freight train it doesn't matter what what the song is doesn't matter what the style is but there's just this unstoppable undeniable train of creativity that's coming at you and so it, the genre is almost inconsequential because it's it's just the packaging in the it's the icing on the cake the actual cake is what's running through the music right thank you Wow. I have to think about that for a moment. <laughs> you can have um, your cake and you can eat it too. <laughs> um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm damaged because I've, I really admire a lot of different styles. Like mm. I hear, um, Nikhil Banerjee doing an intro on an, Indian raga. I mean, it just blows me away. If I hear Coltrane doing his sheets of sound, or if it's a ballad, it's just amazing. Or a Beethoven symphony, it just wipes me out. But deep down, I'm always wondering, well, where's the headbanging section? You know. <laughs> Speaking of the headbanging section, let's talk about this because your use of power chords in quasi metal breakdowns is evident not only in your earlier solo CDs, uh, solo CDs, excuse me, solo releases, but also in torsos, and you also bring it in in Hasidic New Wave. These moments of just all right, here's the distortion, here's the power chords, drummer maybe goes to half time on a china, and guys, it is indeed head banging time. Not to sort of try and peg down the artist, but and I love it, but why? Man, I mean, it feels good. I mean, <laughs> it's just freeing, it's cathartic. It's like being in a mosh pit, 
Yeah. You know, the very first time I went to a <laughs> punk gig, um, I was uh, at Hampshire College in Western Mass, Massachusetts. And, um, you know, I'm light skinned. It's not always right away apparent that I'm African American, but I, I was scared because, you know, th this was, this was, this, the skinhead element was really starting to, um, make itself the felt. So this band from, uh, San Francisco is in the area and we went there. So I was the only black kid there. And it was this band called Flipper. And we happened to walk in, you know, it was very informal. We happened to walk in <laughs> during their sound check. And I kid you not, there's, there's the bass player, you know, with like these black, you know, like cut off. Motorcycle gloves. Things, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. But, but, you know, it's like, he, I, I, I guess um, um, the uh, bicycle racing gloves where, the, you know, the fingers go through so he could play. And I remember looking. He and I saw the LED lights on. I kid you not. He had three distortion boxes in a row, and they were on. <laughs> he, was, he was tuning, and it was like, <laughs> and I was like, "Oh man, I'm getting killed." So to, just to pause it right there for our audience members who don't understand what you just said, do it's you get these uh, stop boxes that are distortion effects for basses or guitars, or you can run anything through them. And normally you only need one because that gets you very distorted. But this guy had three in a row. So he was distorting his sound. He was distorting the distorted sound. And then he was distorting the distortion of the distorted sound. And then and then on top of that, he's trying to tune. And if there's any guitar players out there who've ever had the misfortune of trying to tune a guitar with a distortion pedal on, it is insanely difficult and pretty much cannot be done. So now this guy is trying to tune with three chained distortion pedals together. <laughs> thorough. Thorough. So I was like, wow, I'm going to get killed. And the show started and people went nuts. And this is something I've never seen since. They really went at it. I mean, it was fairly violent, but as soon as you fell down, people around you were like, hey, you okay? You okay? They picked you up. And uh, as soon as you said, okay, they went for it again, you know? It was so inclusive. It was so beautiful. It was so cathartic. My friend actually, you know, who knew I was apprehensive at first, he came up to me and he actually ripped my T-shirt off and yelled at me, are you having fun yet? And I was like, yes! <laughs> so um, the original version of Torsos was actually based on Nina Hagen, the punk rock opera singer, Nina Hagen. And... Um, the Bad Brains. It was a punk rock and reggae band with an opera singer. And I just always remember that energy. And I, I really want that in the music. I think like, you know, uh, probably respectfully and quietly, but I'd love to see like a classical audience. Like, what's that section in Beethoven's Third Symphony where it goes... <laughs> I mean, I would love it if the entire audience quietly, but they were just like all of a sudden like, duh, duh, duh. <laughs> you know. Um, I just, yeah, maybe I'm damaged. I'm just always looking for the headbanging section. There you go. So how do you guys go about putting a song together? in Screaming Headless Torsos. So let's say, for example, Mr. Softy's Nightmare or one of the more complex harmonic tunes. What's that process like? Are you coming into the studio with all the instrumentation figured out in your head? Or are you guys sitting down beforehand? What does that look like? Um, each song has its own story. So Mr. Softy's Nightmare. So... <laughs> um, I... 
my first gig in New York was with this band Second Step. And this was like borderline Ridgemount High. It was like 10 guys in a van, trailer. Back then it was 55 miles per hour in the entire country. So it would toke up 75 miles down south. And like, I don't know, a couple of, you know, 10 days later, we realized the radar detector wasn't working. We were like flying by state troopers. <laughs> so we thought maybe we should chill this. And then like first gig in Mississippi, we're talking 20 hours straight driving. It's just horrible. Um, but the, the, the bass player had this tune that had this Mr. Softy thing in it. And I was like, where does this thing, you know, he quotes it and he was like, I was like, what, what is this? He's like, one summer I had no work and the ice cream truck would park outside of my place every day. And I had that thing in my head. Um, and the only way to get it out was to write a tune. So the same thing happened to me um, in Brooklyn. I didn't have a lot of work and the ice cream truck would, would park in front of my place two, three times a day. Um, and you know, you know, some of these things, they go in your, and especially if you're a musician, it's just like <laughs> putting that thing out. So literally Mr. Softy was driving me crazy. Um, and you know, the song is about, you know, blowing up, you know, about this, to this, this angry guy, you know, this is like pre Oklahoma bombing. You know, you write this stuff today, you could get in trouble. But, you know, it's supposed to be funny. Um, so it's like, what is it? Devious little tunes to destroy, to enthrall little kids' hearts, to make you pay for ice cream and custard cream tarts. Worse than CNN at JFK. It's inviting, it's invading my privacy. These ice cream tunes, they drive me crazy. Evil little hooks, my mind just go, goes hazy. Mr. Softy is the Antichrist. <laughs> so, I, you know, I just assembled this tune. I had this riff and I, you know, started, you know, I had to get it out of my head. That's the reason I wrote that tune. It, it was, again, another cathartic experience. Let's take a quick listen to Mr. Softy's Nightmare so people can understand the level of creative playfulness and also uh, malicious intent that went into this track. So, Mr. Softy's Nightmare. It, so. Incredible. Uh, the, the level of creativity that comes out of these sessions on these Screaming Headless Torsos albums is just, it's mind-numbing. Like, where you guys are coming up with these concepts, the riffs, the, the solos, the lyrical content is unlike anything anyone has done before, during, or since, in my personal opinion. I mean, like, n nothing sounds like the Screaming Headless Torsos. And if it is, I've not heard it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, as I mentioned before, so briefly, but in general, the things I do, they're like groove sandwiches. Mm-hmm. The idea is, again, I, I I guess I'm kind of a musical scientist. I just love, it's just curiosity. If I took a groove from this source and then a harmony, let's say from a classical source, and then a melody from or lyrical content from about Mr. Softy, and then I layer them, the idea is, is that the result is hopefully greater than the sum of the elements. So groove, harmony, melody, ideally one plus one plus one 
equals 5 or 7 or 59,000 or 30 trillion. If, if 1 plus, musically, in, in, in the abstract, if 1 plus 1 plus 1 equals 3, that's kind of a failure to me. It's supposed to somehow, these, these elements that don't, in a way, to somehow make them fit that normally don't fit, there's this kind of, you know, this, there's this energy that really just, it, you're kind of putting things together that normally don't fit together. And it hopefully, in a beautiful way, it, it, it explodes in your face. When you're combining all these different elements in a song, in the studio, in the writing process, are you going for an intellectual satisfaction or you're trying to create this feeling through combining these elements? And once you've found that feeling going through the music, you say, okay, this is it. Well, it's always feeling first and last. It's mm. the feeling first. Oh, I'm inspired by this. Or, wow, I need to get Mr. Softy out of my head. In that case, that's not a good feeling. Um, and then there is the thought process of, uh, I mean, I'm also a person, I, I, I've always kept a music diary. Hmm. And I don't really consider myself a composer. I'm kind of more like a uh, musical hunter and gatherer in that um, I collect grooves. I collect harmonies. I collect melodies that really move me. And I used to have them in a folder. I mean, now it's like a text edit file or word file, whatever. And so when I write things and I, you know, it, usually it's very easy to start something. Oh, I have this great idea. Cool. But, oh, I'm missing harmony. So I go into my harmony bank and I pop things in and out and see what works. So yes, that's a thought process. But also these ingredients I've used, I, I've collected because they move me. I mean, think of cooking. Think of, you know, you're not just going to, you know, you're not going to use stale bread. You're going to use fresh bread. You're going to, you're not going to use like, I don't know, old ketchup. You're going to use, you know, fresh ingredients. But there is the thought process of like, no, I don't want to use this old stuff. I want to use the best stuff. Not really sure if that's even intellectual, but it's, it is, it, in the end, it's all feeling. So then there is the experimentation. And trust me, for every softy or experiment that is successful, there's a bunch that didn't work. Mm. So it's just the curiosity of being inspired by different musics and then using those ingredients in my own music. So in the end, it is feeling. So if we go back to cooking, you know, in the end, it has to taste good, which is not intellectual. Mm. If it doesn't taste good, I throw it out. So looking at your next releases that start in with 2012's Planet Microjam. You really start experimenting and going into this world of microtones even more than you were even on your sort of releases back in the 90s where you still had the double-necked guitar. But now you're really headed into this world where not only are you dealing with microtones, but also the people around you in the ensemble are also dealing with microtones. Um, so instead of having microtone over a bass and drums, you're now involving other instruments. What was that process like and how do you find that sound or even find your way there? So the releases before I was just, you know, I would slur stuff with the whammy bar. But I got excited about Indian music and Middle Eastern music and East Asian music and I, I couldn't play these, I couldn't reproduce the melodies on a fretted instrument because mm. it's a it's a fixed fret. Even if you bend a, a little bit, it's just, it doesn't happen. And certainly you can forget about playing harmony. Um, 
there was one tour with Jack DeJanet where the connections were so tight. I was like, my double neck isn't going to make it. So I took single neck, but I still want to do harmony. So there I am. I'm like trying to like bend one note in a chord <laughs> to try and, and it's, it was kind of a nightmare. So the approach, my microtonal approach is actually a continuum. Some of the stuff is 12 notes per octave, Western. It's not out of tune or microtonal at all. Then I have a microtonal uh, blues concept, where just like the blues, let's say a piano is going, jink, 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 jink. Those are normal Western chords. And on top of that, the blues player or singer is bending these notes and those sweet blue notes, which are microtonal, those are the notes that really move us. So I either do that with blue notes or I use um, Middle Eastern modes or modes that I made up and I push microtonally against normal chords. Um, then the next step is a reverse blues concept. The singer or soloist sings normal and microtonally we push against them with microtonal chords, like that neutral 11 chord that I showed you or um, that was in the Mystic Microgem uh, tune. And then if that's not enough, there's the full on party where it's micro on top and micro on the bottom. Whereas, <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, and I have to admit, it's, it's, uh, microtonality is, again, to come back to cooking, it's like salt. You have to be careful. Too much and it, it's salty. It doesn't taste good. So then the process was, um, this was years of experimentation. Um, and actually, at age 42, in 2006, I decided to um, go back to school. I went back to New England Conservatory, and I essentially got a degree in microtonality. So for two years, I studied with a Turkish harp player, an Indian sitar player. I took one semester with a Chinese music teacher, and for two years, I had... Western microtonal classes. So that dealt with uh, classical microtonal music like Julian Carrillo from Mexico, Alois Haba from the Czech Republic, and Vishnagratsky a little bit from Russia. A little bit of Charles Ives experimented uh, with it a little bit. Harry Parch is a big guy. Um, I checked out some of that stuff. And so then there was the active process of like, you know, really trying to play things precisely, um, doing a lot of, in my uh, Indian and Turkish music lessons. So I would learn these melodies and then I really tried to precisely, as much as possible, write out inflections and lines. I was using the method taught by uh, Joe Maneri, which was this, Greek system of 72 notes per octave. Again, you, you don't use all 72 notes, but if, if let's say, uh, in a passage, a note, let's say there's a note C that's a quarter tone sharp, you know, there's notation for it. So I would notate things um, with this 72 note per octave system. It's equal tempered, meaning that it's every... Uh, step is the same distance just like our 12 note per octave system and it's a compromise in that it's fairly easy to understand because it's divisible by 12 um, at the same time you can approximate you can get very close to a lot of uh, natural overtones and so I would use that system to write out uh, some of the Turkish improvisations and melodies and Indian melodies that I, I had to learn because I and, and Chinese melodies because I really wanted to nail it. And to me, the microtones, as I've mentioned, I perceive them in a very unorthodox way. I perceive them as Eastern blue notes. Hmm. They, hit me, they hit me right here, right in the heart, the same way as when... Jimi Hendrix is 
bending, you know, bending that note that we're like, God, how did he do that? <laughs> um, and what is that note? And why can't I, why can't I do that? Why does it sound that way when I do it? <laughs> That's the most depressing thing. <laughs> So um, it was just like this excitement and you know, I wanted to learn. And so for t after two years, I had some uh, basic melodic understanding of uh, certain Chinese, Indian, Turkish, and... Um, uh, styles and then also a harmonic understanding of some of the uh, 20th century microtonal composers. So then the idea is to actually make a record. So you go in 2012, Planet Microjam, mm -hmm. and then at the same time, you also start an institute, the, uh, the Microjam Institute, correct? Planet Microjam Institute. Yeah, Planet Microjam Institute. And you're really trying to explore and not only put records out, but also bring this exploration that you went through in this two-year period to other students who are in college at Berkeley for them to explore and have the same moments of microtonal revelation as you did. Well, It's really lucky that um, Roger Brown uh, is the president at Berkeley College of Music. He's really open-minded. Um, and I really had the support of uh, Dr. Larry Simpson, who is the provost, essentially the vice president. And he told me, and to me, this is really the way you want to run a music school. I know people have various opinions on Berkeley, but he told me, he was like, hey man, you got something. I don't know what it is, but if there's any way I can support it, um, I will. And I wanna make very, very clear, I do not have to like what you come up with. I mean, I was kind of blown away, you know, as, uptight as uh, music schools can be, institutions, I was like, wow. And I also, I, so he said, he, we, I want you to show what Berkeley can do. And I told him my experience was, I started teaching at Berkeley and I always looked on the outside. Like um, for a minute, I was on the road a lot with Hiromi, then Jack DeJeanette, then Rudrish Mahantapa. I was always looking, wherever I went, I was like, so, uh, is anyone doing microtonal stuff? Um, is it avant-garde or is it traditional? Uh, uh, I mean, I would ask the same question in Europe, uh, South Africa, uh, uh, China, Japan, Taiwan. And the fact of the matter, it was, I, I realized that everything was at Berkeley because Berkeley has one of the highest percentages of uh, foreign students, something like 25 to 30%. And when you scratch on the surface, you scratch the surface, you find out, oh, this R&B singer, well, they, they're, they're also a traditional Japanese koto player. And this piano player, um, is a Greek oud player or lute oh. player. And oh, this guitar player, this guy Guch Gule, we would hang out after school and barter. Half an hour I'd show him jazz chord scales and inversions and stuff. And then for half an hour, and he, he graduated from the Istanbul Conservatory and he had a fretless guitar. So he would, he would show me in, in Turkish melodies and inflections and stuff. So um, there are plenty of musical reasons that I can give you, but Berkeley's uh, mission statement is that they want to attract the you know the most talented students from all over the world and create global leaders in the industry. And I remember at uh, NEC, New England Conservatory. 
I was taking a musical uh, musicology class, and I I reread this line in this book over and over again. The there's an estimate that if you take all the musics in the world, that's something. It's all of all of the world's musics put together is something like seventy to eighty percent microtonal. I was stunned, and um. When I graduated, I showed up uh, and talked to Ron Savage. He's the dean now. He was the head of the ensemble department. I said, okay, here's my degree, and um, I want to teach you stuff. I have a method. And he's like, okay, let's yeah. – when you do a new class, they, they it's a proto class. He said, let's try it. And I've had mind-blowing experiences where um, – I was able to work with students like Mono Neon, uh, David Ginyard, who went on to play with Solange and now plays with Terrence Blanchard, um, Evan Marion on bass, uh, unbelievable microtonal keyboard players from the Republic of Georgia and Turkey, Georgi Mikatsi, Uta Artun, uh, Louis Cato, this multi-instrumentalist who's now on The Colbert Show. Uh, Nikki Glaspy, her first gig out of school was uh, Beyonce. I mean, it, the list goes on and on and on. So Planet Micro Jam, taking microtonal influences from the planet and jamming on them. Um, so that's what it is. And I so, recommend that anyone listening to this podcast after we're done and after you've listened through the entirety of Dave's um, discography, go check out the version of Cashmere that you guys did because it is brutal, uh, brutal. Thank, it is so much fun. I mean, it starts with this unbelievable Arabic violin player, Laith Siddiq uh, from Iraq. And he then moved to Jordan, so Iraq, Jordan. Um, the other soloist is one of the leading, I mean, he's the leading Chinese instrumentalist, traditional instrumentalist after Wu Man, Yazi Guo, unbelievable um, swana player. This is like a Chinese oboe. He invented a mouthpiece that moves. So he can, a lot of these instruments, you can only play in certain keys. So now he can play in all 12 keys. Uh, Georgi Mikadze, as I mentioned, from the Republic of Georgia is on keys. Um, oh boy, this is where I'm getting old. But I can tell you this, the rhythm section was from Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> That's why it sounds fat. <laughs> I get Michael Jam in the house. And to be honest, I was in bricks, man. I was, you know, uh, Jimmy Page was in the audience. I, I was lucky to meet him beforehand. Later on, he said he really enjoyed it, which was great. Yeah, I, I, I cannot imagine playing Cashmere in front of uh, Jimmy Page. That must have been quite quite the experience. <laughs> the odd thing is, I, I wasn't planning to... This is like... A, um, a graduation concert. So whoever's graduating, um, they get to play on this concert. It's a big deal. I was like, oh, you know, okay, cool. I don't, I don't need to be. So they asked me to put something together, and they gave me the list of tunes not to do that the house band was going to play. And I was thinking, Cashmere, and I was like, nah, you know, well, I can't do that. I have to do something else. And I looked at the list over and over and over again. It didn't list Cashmere. I was stunned. I was like, okay, that's mine. So it was a, that was a great experience. Absolutely. So moving on from starting the uh, Planet Micro Jam Institute and 2012's Planet Micro Jam, uh, you do another album called David Fijinsky's Flam Blam Pan Asian Micro Jam. Good luck saying that five times fast. And also a new album called Micro Jazz. 
And what's really interesting to hear on micro jazz is not just your microtonal influence, but then the sax players using unconventional fingerings to create microtones with a saxophone, which in and of itself is, you hear it. And if you've ever played a saxophone, you know how you can get those sounds out of the thing. But to think about using that in a microtonal world, it's just you're creating, you're almost this renaissance man for microtones in the West. It's amazing. Well, um, that was a partnership with this crazy German sax player, Philip Gerschlauer. Okay, I thought I was a microtonal nut. <laughs> he uses an untempered 128-note octave per, scale, uh, per, uh, per octave uh, scale, uh, note system. Uh, and, you know, I don't really like these YouTube, you know, look how fast I can play. Um, you know, what is that? The bumblebee, the F flight, flight of the bumblebee. bumblebee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to hear that crap again. It's like, you know, it's like, and at some point it's just, weird. or, you know, look at this technical stuff I can do. But man, check him out when he plays, when he packs 128 notes in one octave. It's nuts. Yeah, that was um that was an amazing experience. Uh we were able to get Jack DeJeanette play on that. That was I, I played with Jack and uh he played on Planet Microjam on a tune, two tunes. But to have him on the on the entire record and just have enough time in the studio, just let him stretch and see his process. Wow. I have to tell you, if the Miles Davis Quintet was a car, then <laughs> watching Jack swing is like having the privilege to look at the hood and watch the engine rev. It is a sight to behold. I mean, nobody has his touch. And as Mark Giuliana said, this great drummer, he said, Many people copy other people. You know, you got your Van Halen clones, you have your Pat Metheny clones, you have your Tony Williams. And there are some people you can see that are imp influenced by Jack, but he said nobody does Jack because they can't. He's not copyable. He's, he's really, I mean, he's, he's amazing. He's really, uh, don't know what to what else to say. Matt Garrison on bass, and they've been playing together a lot, so that was amazing. And then, as I mentioned before, Ge uh, Georgi Mikadze on um, microtonal keyboards. What's amazing about Georgi, and actually he has a new record out called Georgian Micro Jams. That you play on. Yeah. Uh, the Republic of Georgia has these microtonal... Um, choirs that are absolutely amazing. Even Stravinsky said it's a totally untapped resource. Mm. And um, on Georgian micro jams, uh, so Georgi, Georgi took my class and then he used that concept to go home and transcribe um, Georgian traditional music. And he used those tuning systems to write original music. I mean, um, and this is all, these are all Berkeley connections. So, so yeah, micro jazz was amazing. Um, and, and, and an amazing experience. Pl uh, Flam Blam, that was the result of a Guggenheim fellowship that I got. And, um, I wanted to take various aspects of Asian music. Um, yeah, it's it's dedicated to Olivier Messiaen, this French composer who was an amateur um, ornithologist. And so a lot of his melodies are 
uh, bird song in- inspired. Hmm. Speaking um, of that, Dave, have you seen making the rounds on uh, social media that guy who's been transcribing the bird song? Um, I've seen some composers do this, but yeah. Well, I hope he's doing it microtonally because, as you may know, birds could give two hoots, haha, <laughs> about twelve notes per octave. <laughs> so, um, well, after I got the grant, I did like an entire summer. I did research, and uh, among others, but mostly, I went to this website, Zeno Canto which supposedly covers 71% of all bird species all over the world, something like 8,000 examples. I'm not going to show I didn't listen to every cuckoo that's out there. But I basically worked my way through this website and other places, and I chose the bird songs of six or seven birds. I transcribed them microtonally. I give a big nod to Olivier Messiaen, but unlike Messiaen, I asked the birders if I could use, I have for permission to use the recordings in the, uh, in the, rec- uh, the, the bird song recordings in the musical composition. So you hear the bird song and then you see what we do with it. Either it's a source for, th- you know, for passages that are through composed or, improvised and i have to tell you mozart's right he said some of the greatest musicians in the world uh are birds um so i got this grant i started writing i was really excited the bird songs provide um all of the uh melodic material and as a as usual normal i mean as always i guess again i'm damaged (laughs) but i would take those melodies and put them into a scale and then stack them into a chord so these are avian chord scales (laughs) these are bird bird chords I don't know if damaged is the right way. I think the line between damaged and genius must be a very fine one. I think you're I think you're on the genius side of the damaged genius line there. But the the concept of and as you you just you are a self-described jazz guitar player who does not play jazz, you're taking the jazz mindset of let me harmonize this thing to the seventh, to the ninth, to the, let's let's do extensions, let's do tensions. But doing it with microtonal bird song. <laughs> so, I uh, I thought I was doing really well, and I had <laughs> melodic, and then now, consequently, harmonic material. But I didn't have any grooves. I was like, "What am I gonna? If I just put some beat underneath this?" And I had a dark moment where I thought, "This is." Um, I thought my mouth finally wrote a check my couldn't cash. (laughs) (laughs) And there is, I think, the Northern Nightingale or something. It goes like, uh, blah, 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 blah. Oh, the reason why it's called Flam is because... If you listen to a chickadee, the 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 Carolina chickadee has this like <laughs> has this kind of call, but it's always flam. So a flam is, is like two rhythmic attacks in a row, plop. Um, but that happen at a very slight uh, distance apart in time. Yeah. So like, and so it, it yeah. So it sort of sounds like one sound is like plop. Exactly. Yeah. So not da da, but cla cla, yeah. cla. Um, like the word clack. Mm. That's or flam is a sound word. Full lamb, flam, 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 flam. Yeah. Oh, indeed. So that if you listen carefully, it's actually not. 
but plop, 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 plop. <laughs> and <clears throat> the northern nightingale is like plop, 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 plop. This bird sings this way. Well, we can play an example. Plop, 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 plop. And I thought, wow, okay, there you are, Fuse. You got this like crazy wacko bird thing. What are you going to do? This is stupid. And literally I went, you know, here I am. People are going to think, what is this? Plop, 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 dum, dum, stupid, dum, dum. But then I was like, oh, plop, 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 the clock, the plop, the clock, the Dilla, Jay Dilla, Jay Dilla. Genius. That's a genius. So that's why... Flam is dedicated and inspired by Olivier Messiaen and Jay Dilla. So, it's this microtonal bird jam um, inspired by a French composer and um, this rap producer. Um, We should probably, if we can... If you can play the beginning of Dance of the Oirapuru. So you hear, and it's amazing, the bird actually sounds like that. (laughs) So we use that to improvise, and then later on it becomes a through-composed section. Right, so the second movement is Dance of the Uirapuru. That's where the Uirapuru is the melody. In Flam, the third movement, the Uirapuru then turns into to the bass so now instead of like now it's like and the northern nightingale is the melody so you can hear that if you play just i don't know maybe a minute of the third movement flam see how um, various parts, they're melodic, they're bass, and then in another movement, I use the Uirapuru melody, I, I stack it into a chord, so you can hear me improvise over D minor Uirapuru. <laughs> oh, you know, guys, let's play that little tune, Uirapuru and D minor, a one, two, three, four. <laughs> Flat. <laughs> So that was an amazing experience. And these are all students who played on this. Wow. Uh, Alex Bailey went on to play with Marcus Miller. Um, Uta Artun, who plays uh, keys, is faculty at Berkeley now. Um, I don't know if you've heard of Jake Sherman, keyboard player. Uh, on, I mean... Teaching is hard work, but when you get to work with these, with this caliber, teaching is a privilege. Mm. You know, I did get a job out of necessity. Um, my opera punk career didn't go that well. <laughs> um, and I always heard t- people say, oh, I learned so much from my students. It's like, yeah, duh, whatever. Wow. Stunned. 
So the entire my 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 entire microtona catalog wouldn't have been possible without students. And luckily, with with the support of Berkeley, I've been able to uh, invite guests. So that's how the association with Jack DeJanet came about. We've had Jojo Mayer, Mark Juliana, um, Leith Siddick, Arabic, um, Bassam Saba, who unfortunately recently passed away from COVID. That was a huge blow. Um, microtonal guitar players, John Catler, uh, Turkish zither players. The opportunities and the things you can do are just absolutely exciting. And in the class, I tell students, this is such a new field. Every semester, someone comes up with a new chord or melody that nobody has ever done. I mean, where where do you have the opportunity to innovate before you even leave school? I say that at the beginning of every semester in the microtonal class. And the, and the students are looking at me like deer in the headlight. Huh? Yeah. The, here's an opportunity, musically speaking, where you can actually be Captain Kirk. It's so incredible to see that you start on this journey to try and find a method for the microtonal madness. You figure out a way of codifying it through a jazz perspective. We make a scale, we understand the modes of that scale, we harmonize that scale, and now we play. And then to see that you are creating this space where even more people are now branching off on their own directions. They're going, they're finding their own chords, their own, their own pathways. On a meta level, it's all jazz, right? Because jazz is all about finding your own pathway and hearing your way through the music and just following that feeling. So you're, you're playing jazz on a multitude of levels, not just a literal instrument level, but you're taking that jazz mindset and using it as a framework for people to learn and explore new areas. And it's so, so cool. Um, we are actually at the two hour mark. I, only, I know I only asked you for uh, 90 minutes. Um, there's like literally three more pages of questions I have for you. Maybe we can have you back again uh, with, the, the, with the technical glitches uh, worked out. No worries. Thank you for your patience with that. No problem. Um, it Time really, flies. We're having fun. Absolutely. I, I just want to let you know this is such an honor to be able to talk with you. Um, really just admired your guitar playing, music, composition for so many years. And it's so cool to be able to connect with you one-on-one -on -one and really sort of get your mindset here. Um, this has really been cool. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.